name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So for us who have gathered up our families to come to church today, this reading is kind of a harsh one, this gospel today. Uh, much like last uh, Sunday's gospel where we uh, all got ready, came to church, brought our dads with us on Father's Day, and then heard how children would rise up against their fathers, and fathers would rise up against their children. Um, and it continues today, and it's kind of hard to hear. Uh, many of us, uh, as I mentioned last week, we come to church uh, to help raise our family in the faith. Uh, because it binds our family together, because we pray together and we share our faith together, we teach each other. So what does Jesus mean? Why this hard reading again and again? Uh, and I think there's several meanings, but I think uh, one of them is that uh, Jesus, and Matthew certainly knew in his time, uh, that there would be cost. Uh, that claiming to be followers of Christ would come with sacrifice. I imagine the disciples learned that early on when they came home and told their spouses, uh, I won't be here for a while and I won't be bringing in any money. I've got to go and follow this guy uh, wherever he leads. Uh, but you'll be okay. I imagine that was the first time we knew that families would be divided for the sake of the gospel. And in Matthew's time, persecution was already happening. By claiming that you were a follower of Jesus Christ, you were uh, being persecuted by the state, but also... The patriarch or the family is the one who determined what religion the family was. If the patriarch said uh, we're Jewish, we've been Jewish for, uh, for centuries, uh, it was a violation of that trust or of that responsibility as part of that family to say, I'm a follower of Jesus. And it caused difficulty. It caused tension. Families were at odds with one another. But then I looked at the Old Testament lesson. And on Thursdays I was preparing, uh, I saw the Old Testament lesson and I figured wh why were they put together the way that they are. Usually there's a theme that runs through the readings and, and part of the uh, preacher's job is to find that thread. Uh, and I thought it was just kind of laid together clumsily uh, on this particular Sunday uh, because the Old Testament lesson talks about conflict within the family, uh, but I don't think it's consistent uh, with what the New Testament lesson was about. Uh, the Old Testament lesson is about a division between family uh, uh, because of, of, of the legitimacy or the birthright uh, of Ishmael versus Isaac. Uh, and uh, in, in my opinion, uh, God isn't leading Abraham towards a greater justice or greater truth. Uh, he's just kind of turning a blind eye uh, to the family dynamic at place. Uh, so uh, as I thought about it, I wondered why are these two passages uh, bound together? And then I realized... Uh, that during this part of the year, uh, we're just going to read through the story of Abraham. Uh, so they're not necessarily bound. But I do think there's some deep truth in that first lesson. Some deep truth that I encourage you to pay attention to and to hear. Uh, the story is about Abraham. Uh, and the story is about Isaac. And the story is about Sarah. And the story is about Hagar. And the story is about Ishmael. Uh, and all are pivotal people in this story. Now remember, Sarah has uh, twice now, in recent chapters, uh, been uh, told by Abraham that, that they're going to pretend that they're brother and sister. Uh, she's been handed off to kings twice to be married. Uh, and uh, Sarah didn't have the wonderful moment where God spoke uh, to her and said, your ancestors are going to outnumber the stars. They spoke to Abraham. Uh, and Abraham shared it with Sarah. And so it has uh, been an incredible strain on Sarah that she has not been able to deliver on that promise that God made to her. Um, and uh, she is now 90 years old. Uh, she has not been able to have a child. Um, and uh, in her late 80s, she felt so uh, broken up about this that she said, you know, Abraham, I'm supposed to deliver you a child, uh, and I have failed at that. Uh, take my handmaiden, um, Hagar, uh, uh, wed her and have a child with her, and then you will start to have what God has promised you that I have been unable to fulfill. And so uh, it takes place uh, 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 immediately. Hagar is with child, uh, and all of a sudden Sarah, I think, resents the decision that she made, um, uh, resents the child that, that grew, seems to be growing so easily inside Hagar, uh, resents the fact that Hagar seems to be walking a little taller uh, now that she's been able to... to uh, 
to give Abraham what Abraham has so desperately wanted, uh, and, and tensions flare. And so uh, Sarah uh, really gets quite upset, and Hagar realizes the tension, uh, and she disappears. She runs into the wilderness, and God visits Hagar and says, your child is destined for special things. Your child uh, is an incredibly special child. Uh, go back to Abraham. Go back to Sarah. I will watch over your child. Uh, and Hagar names God, now listen to this, the God who sees. That's the name um, that Hagar gives to God, the God who sees. And so she comes back and she has this child uh, and, and Abraham falls in love with this child, uh, raises this child. Uh, I mean, this child is the apple of Abraham's eye um, and Sarah continues to, to struggle with, um, with the, the lack of fulfillment of, um, uh, of, of what she uh, is supposed to deliver to Abraham, of what God is supposed to deliver to her. And so she even laughs uh, at the promise that, that Isaac would be born to her in her 90s. In fact, the word Isaac uh, means laughter. Um, the word Ishmael means God hears. So Isaac is born. And you can only imagine Sarah. You can see her kind of there watching uh, her beautiful little baby, the, uh, the fulfillment of 90 years of waiting there crawling around and Ishmael playing with the, the child and, uh, and her sort of wanting to say, don't touch him, uh, leave him alone. Uh, you know, you're going to corrupt him. Uh, and seeing that uh, Abraham and, and, and Ishmael have this history together, this relationship, uh, and you can see all of her attention, all of her affection uh, on this little child. And so she tells Abraham, uh, please get rid of him. This is your child. This is the one that God promised you. This is the one for whom your ancestors will outnumber the stars. Get rid of him. Dismiss him. And Abraham is heartbroken. So he prays to God, and God says, listen to Sarah. And so they send uh, Hagar away. He uh, gives Hagar uh, uh, some rations and some, some uh, food and water for the journey, hands the, the, uh, the child uh, uh, to, to her and sends her away. Uh, and as they go and they are in the wilderness and they are desperately hungry and it looks as though this is how the story will end. Ishmael will, will die in the wilderness um, and she's begging uh, God to, to intervene. Uh, it says, God hears. Remember the name of Ishmael. Ishmael means God hears. God hears his cry and says again, this child has a wonderful destiny. This child uh, will be the father of a, of a great tribe. Uh, this, this child is special in my eyes. And he creates a spring. Or he opens... Hagar's eyes to the spring, and she sees it, uh, and we know he grows, and he's, a, he's an accomplished hunter, uh, and he takes an Egyptian wife uh, and, and, and begins his story, the story uh, that might never have taken place uh, under Sarah uh, and Abraham's eyes, uh, and we see that, that, that fulfillment. Um, but like I said, I don't think that conflict is the same thing that the gospel's talking about, where sometimes by following the gospel, uh, we leave behind our family or we have to make decisions that are contrary to our family. Um, but I did, in the process, come up with two things that I think connect these two stories in a beautiful way. One, Ishmael never could have been who he was called to be without stepping out from his family identity. In his family, he was the other son. He was the son from the handmaiden. He wasn't the son that was going to be uh, the, 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 the one for whom Abraham would eventually outnumber the stars in his ancestry. He was the other. What he would never be able to fully claim apart from his new journey, his new identity, was that he was a beloved child of God, that God made him for a special purpose. He never would have been able to claim that baptiz baptismal identity that Mackenzie and all of us claim uh, when we are baptized into that truth that the skies open up in our baptism and God descends and says, this is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. That is our core identity. And that would have been subjugated under all of the wrappings of, of that family dynamic. And so he was freed from that. Second, Second is the peace that we hear that gets lost early on in that gospel that I think is the heart and soul of that gospel. It isn't that there'll be conflict. 
It's that amidst that conflict, even though it doesn't promise that everything will work out, there's that promise that, that God loves us so much, that God loves us so much that God counts the hairs on our heads, however easy it might be for some of us. But God knows us that intimately and loves us that fully. And when we can claim that, we can understand that as our core identity, we can wander in the wilderness, we can accomplish incredible things, we can go out and do the work that God has called us to do. I think in that, we claim our baptism. We respect the dignity of all human beings. We seek and serve Christ in all persons. We walk boldly in there's a beautiful gospel hymn that kind of came from uh, the, 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 the joining together of the Psalms uh, in these two passages from Matthew that refer to the sparrow. Uh, and this one uh, where it talks about sparrows you know, uh, in flight and says, you know, how much more does God love you than these sparrows? Yet God keeps them in the air. Uh, and so this woman, uh, uh, Sevilla uh, D. Martin, who wrote this hymn in 1905, <laughs> Uh, the Eye of the Sparrow, describes how she came about writing this, this beautiful hymn. Uh, she was up um, uh, in Elmira, New York, and she was visiting beloved friends, uh, uh, the, the, the Doolittles, and they were an older couple, and they were much beloved in their community, and they were sort of an exemplar of, of, of living out of faith in their community. Uh, she had been bedridden for 20 years, bedridden from, for 20 years, Miss Doolittle, um, and her husband, uh, Mr. Doolittle, ha had been in a wheelchair most of his life, but still had to get uh, into the wheelchair and, and go to work uh, to be able to provide uh, the means to take care of his wife and take care of him. Uh, and they have been doing this, uh, uh, this work of, uh, of existing for so very long. Uh, but they didn't just exist, they thrived amidst all this adversity. They were... Uh, Two of the most positive people this community had known, uh, people uh, would often comment, how are they so filled with joy uh, and spirit amidst all of their struggles? And uh, finally, uh, Sevilla asks them, what is it that gives you that lightness and that joy and that effervescence amidst all your adversity? And she answers simply, his eye is on the sparrow and he watches me. And all of a sudden, her eyes light up in the hymn that has touched many, especially during difficult parts of their journey, was written. It was written from their experience of realizing their core identity wasn't oldest child, youngest child, uh, favorite child, black sheep, crippled, bedbound, but as a beloved child of God. And what we will do today is we'll remind all of ourselves that is our core identity. That is Mackenzie's core identity. As wonderful as her parents and family are, her core identity is she is a beloved child of God with whom God is well pleased. Amen.